the monarch butterfly migrates every year all the way from Canada through the U.S. and goes back to Mexico. We are like the butterfly. I came to the United States with my mom and four siblings when I was about 10 years old. I came when I was in eighth grade. My dad had a bigger dream for us. Growing up in a Catholic family, it was pretty hard for me to be able to express or be myself. And when I had the chance to come to the U.S., so I was so happy because I was going to be able to be myself. As LGBT people who are part of this migrant community, we constantly have to come out. In the LGBT mainstream community, I constantly come out as undocumented. In the migrant community, I constantly come out as a LGBT because I understand that there's a lack of knowledge in both sides. And every time I come out, I get this feeling when I told my mom and dad, because I know I'm gonna be judged, right? But I understand that this is what it takes to push the boundary. Immigrants are standing here, no papers, no fear! I just remember oftentimes coming back to this question of this shared social and political exclusion of both like LGBT people and like undocumented people and where there were opportunities to push both communities. For me, I think those two identities really pushed me to want to get involved and, and pushed me to want to take action. I've been living in fear for so long, and this is a way for me to say, hey, we are part of society, we are here, we demand not to be in the shadows anymore, and our voices must be heard. I have seen since 9-11, uh, uh -huh. everything start to, to, to change in opposition to immigrants. We have discrimination, housing issues, wage theft all the time. Many laws start to be introduced. The police enforcement is terrible. Before, you can have a problem with your car in the road. The police officer used to approach, okay, do you need help? How I can help you? Now, nobody wants to wait. If the car breaks, they want to leave immediately because they know the police will be there asking for driver's license. And, get, and getting arrested. I once got to stop for a, for a traffic ticket and I remember going to court to fight it. Maybe 60% of the people that were there were all Latino, were all mostly undocumented. And I remember thinking, all we're gonna end up in detention and all we're probably gonna end up in deportation. By the time 2010 came around, you had people who were afraid to leave their homes. We kept hearing about ice raids and people being picked up in their homes, at work, on the streets. You were seeing laws and policies that were criminalizing people, shutting down their access to justice, and creating this veil, this environment of fear. I think that's where it clicked and it was just like, this is an, like, this is an attack. It's also very strategic. And it's also very focused on pushing our communities out. Those folks on the grassroots level had no choice but to say we're going to fight back against enforcement, we're going to fight back against deportations. And that's when I got tired of it and, and I decided to come out of the shadows and, and come out of the closets and start speaking up against it. When I first came out as undocumented, I had the biggest fear of anyone knowing. What if one day my mom gets taken away or my dad? If you live with fear, you're not living. And I don't want to stop living. Arpaio, you've been looking for us. Here we are. Come out. In 2012, the bleeding point of the community was deportations. And so we needed to direct attention and support and action towards addressing that very particular issue. The organizations here in Phoenix decided to do the Andokubas, which it was spending about six weeks traveling around the southwest and the south side of the United States. It wasn't necessarily that we planned it, but it was almost split half and half between queer and straight people. I learned that I wasn't the only one fighting in the intersection of being undocumented and also being gay. We were trying to really inject the presidential debate with the issue of deportations. 
we wanted to set a particular tone with the president, you know, and asking him, starting to use this frame of, what will be your legacy, President Obama? Will you be the deporter in chief? Or will you be remembered as a president who took action on this very important issue, who stopped this crisis? Underneath it, I think there was a growing and a deep desire for people to be able to be seen as who they were and to be able to come out and to shed that fear. Specifically for some of the queer folks, um, it was that with the addition of like, I'm no longer going to participate in immigrant rights, having to hide myself as a queer person as well. We ended up going to North Carolina to the Democratic National Convention with the civil disobedience and shut down the street outside the convention. We got arrested. We were taken to the sheriff department and fingerprints, all that. I think it was not a point of my life that I decided to risk everything, everything I had. I guess after all the pressure that we're getting from people outside, they decided to let us go. The times that I've been living in fear just disappeared. I felt more powerful. There was a renewed hope that comprehensive immigration reform would pass, but we knew better than to put all, all our eggs in that one basket. And so in 2013, we launched the Not One More campaign. We did a shutdown ICE action in Atlanta, Georgia. And it was the Georgia Latino Alliance for Human Rights with Southerners on New Ground and Project South. There's a clarion call that happens. It's like there's something that calls to people and they're just drawn to it. We were planning to shut down ICE action. There's like 40 of us there, the trainers, the base, the babies, the girlfriends, the boyfriends, the husbands, all everyone. And we're like going around and doing intros for the first time. People are saying their name, where they live, and their preferred gender pronouns. Um, and like we explained what that was. The first meeting that I went where they asked for a preferred gender pronoun, I remember being very confused about that question. And it wasn't until I sat down with one of my very good friends who kind of explained the importance of, of creating space for people's identities who are normally not given a space to do so in society. It's one thing to say I don't like how you look. It's another thing to say I don't like how you are. It's another one to say I don't think you should exist and I have the innate right to take that from you. And it is that that brings us together. As LGBTQ people, we understand and can align ourselves with some of the conditions that our undocumented, gay or straight, brothers and sisters are facing. What can we do together to that end so that nobody else has to live in the shadows, nobody else has to live in exile, nobody else has to never, you know, never be able to see their family again. It's just like a willingness and an openness and an excitement to figure out how to communicate and build. Los gladiadores recibieron cargos de desobediencia. It was nerve-wracking, but just seeing people being willing to put their bodies at risk and to lock down to a gate that, like, it, it's always moving, right? It's always like allowing cars in and out um, and shutting it down for a day at least, so that people who who had like maybe a deportation hearing that day could have six more months. By us stopping things that day, we maybe created a space where people could stay here longer. We want to be in alliance with you. We want to put our bodies on the line with you. We want to show you with our bodies that we're here to keep you safe and to keep us safe. Because we know somehow in our spirits that like our destinies are intertwined. There was that brotherhood, that sense of hermandad, right? That we were in this together and we were gonna protect each other. At the end of that day of that civil disobedience, everybody was friends with everybody. They joined the jail or they joined the event together and everything changed. I do believe that the stronger connection came via actions, no words you know, which is a strong connection. When we laid our lives down, when we said we would be on that same front line, um, that became respect. 
And it was that respect that forged that bond and that relationship and people began to really open up and say, we won't live in fear. I think what Song has learned from GLAR or from groups like Puente in Arizona is just an incredible gain for us because here we've had the opportunity to really understand what it's like for organizations to have each other's back even when your base and constituency looks really different. And part of that is shared struggle, shared risk, and showing courage together. Atlanta very much prides itself on the civil rights legacy, but the power structure doesn't want to see people in the streets. Um, it, it wants that to be more of like a historical memory and not a current reality. And so all those demonstrations, 20, 25,000 people, mega rallies, like Atlanta has never seen in the last 40 years, was deeply phenomenal. There's so much more work to do and, and collaborations that need to be made to advocate for the most marginalized in our community and the ones that are criminalized by the system, especially trans women of color. If we don't bring a light to make sure that their voices are heard, and that the abuse of ICE is being exposed, we're just gonna get and keep getting abused by the system. And that's one of the reasons I go in there, to the detention centers to visit that part of our community. It has to be done. It's about doing the work hand in hand, walking you know, side by side. There's so many things working against us, and then if we're able to really build a political and organizing platform that brings in all these identities, and at the end of the day, you know, it really speaks to this is all about all of us, then all of us can get behind that.